live at Kuba Record Shop. I'm in the red. Yeah, and I'm on the floor. Still is cold. And um, everybody's in the house. We're all chilling. And I'm interviewing DJ Secret. Man, Stan, and all that. Yeah, man, we in here, you know, it's uh, it's been a long time of uh crossing paths, you know, being in the same place at the same time, you know, when uh, a lot of memorable stuff has been going down, so, um, you know, it's cool to be able to, to, to spend a minute to, to build, you know, with the cats that are on the same page, you know, to do it the way you do it, you know, or understand how you do it, you know, without questioning it, you know what I mean? Rare thing, but, um, yeah, my first question, like, I've been seeing DJ Secret since I was in, like, the eighth grade, which was like 90, maybe 91. I was going to Brown Ride, sneaking in, you know, with the homies, they were running the floor and all that, dancing and whatnot. Yeah. And this dude was playing some shit that I kind of knew, but didn't know. It was some shit that was like sampled, you know, hip hop shit. I was like, I know that shit, but I don't know that shit. But damn, that's Tribe, but that ain't Tribe. So it kind of opened me up on some record shit. I wasn't hearing nobody in my community doing that shit. So my number one question for this dude is, when you start buying records? About 77, I remember I went to uh, the Montgomery Ward Shopping Center <laughs> and got the, uh, the Brothers Johnson Strawberry Letter 45. Oh, like I was just going off that. And I have an older sister and she always had hella records. So, you know, I was always, you know, running her wax at the house and like, um, you know, you'd have little like, like your little homies would come around and shit and I would be the dude kind of playing music, you know, putting records on and shit. Yeah. You know, you go to your relative's house, you know, and they doing it big and I'm fucking with, you know, my auntie's records or my grandmother's records or whatever. Yeah. So yeah, it started a minute ago. And so it was like being familiar with the music and when hip hop started to grow into what it became, it was really fascinating finding all of these things that I knew musically being kind of uh, sort of updated, you know, yeah. breathing new life into some things, you True. know, putting a, putting a twist on it, you know, and uh, it just was like, a, like, you know, like, man, what, what is that? Like, I just need to find that. Yeah. Like, you know, and it's just like, you don't even really know how to find it, you know, because this was before they were like cheap books and web pages yeah. and snitches. You just had to just get out there and just find it, you know, and just like, you know, and just, you know what I'm saying? And then it was a matter of like making that relevant, you know, and there was a period where I used to DJ and it would be, you know, like, like, like party rock and shit, not like some, you know, something artistic where you can just kind of play around and I wouldn't play anything new, like no beat music, no program shit, just all old shit, like for whatever, an hour and a half and fools would dance, like, and be happy and like be cool, you know what I mean? And like. You know, it was just like, it was something that, you know, that I enjoyed, but I didn't get a lot of it. So I thought every chance I get, I'm gonna do that. You know, and it just sort of grew out of that. It just, you know, it just, the more of that I did, the more stuff I acquired and, you know, it, it just kept getting bigger, you know, it just kept getting bigger. Well, how long have you been making beats? Man, I got my, uh, I got the MPC 2000 in around 2000. I bought it from one of my homies in my neighborhood when I lived in Mid City. Um, he had gear and he wasn't really touching it with any regularity. He was starting to get real computer based. One of them dudes. Yeah. He's real cerebral like that. He built his own computers and whatnot. Yeah. But you know, I wanted one that was raw, that didn't have any upgrades. I wanted to do it myself. Yeah. You know, and I chose the MPC being like a big fan of like, like Tribe, like the Uma. Yeah. You know, and I remember uh, in 93 when um, Midnight Marauders was coming out. There was an interview up in Rap Pages, and it was like back when it was like question and answer. It was an interview, you know, yeah. and they were talking about gear and what kind of machines they used. And Tip said that, uh, you know, they made Midnight Marauders on the MPC, and I was like, really? Like, is that where that sound is coming from? Because it was such a progression from low end theory, yeah. which was foolish, you know, which was off the hook, you know what I mean? But I was like, I, I thought it couldn't get more advanced than that. And then they took it to the next place. It was like, you know, just that put that seed in my head that I was like, okay. I, when I get a machine, I just need to get an MPC. It was just something about it. It was like kind of like a, like a brotherhood, you know? Yeah. I mean, which is what Uma translates into, right? Yeah, true. You know, and it was the whole science of it, you know, to like, you know, take these things, these records, you know what I'm saying? And like, convert that into like, just something entirely different, you know? Yeah, so, right. you know, I kept it real, you know, 
strict at first. Like I just, you know, I would only touch certain things, you know what I mean? And the more I found things that people had used, the more I understood how to use the things that I find. True. Because at first you hear it and it's fascinating. You know, they put all this stuff together. Like Dr. Dre was instrumental in that. Like when he, he'd be on K-Day, like mid eighties, mm -hmm. like he had like the traffic jam, it'd be like a five o'clock mix show. And he was doing stupid shit. Like it was four track shit, but he was like, it was just so much stuff going on, you know what I mean? Like, I'd hear him dropping stuff that I still find today. Yeah. I'm like, damn, like, you know what I mean? Like, it's, so it was like, um, you know, like, again, like a, like a brotherhood, a fraternity, you know, you're kind of learning about these kinds of things, you know, and it's like, you know, I remember I took a trip to New York, and, you know, I'm walking around and I'm fascinated, you know, because for us, it's like so much of that stuff came from there. Yeah. It's not like you ride in New York, but it's just like, you know, like, you know all these places from all the music that you listen to. Sure. And I always wanted to know what the original for Peach Fuzz was, you know, uh, KMD. You know, and I was like, you know, and um, there was some false information going around. Fools were saying that it was uh, something that it wasn't. Yeah. They were like a shaft from Africa, you know what I'm saying? And I was like, I had had that record. I'm like, it's not on there. Yeah. You know, so I'm in New York at, a, I think it was Beat Street Records in Brooklyn. And there was yeah, a dude well, just in the bins or whatever, and we started talking about records and stuff. And I, you know, more or less mentioned it to him that, you know, I always wanted to know what the hell Peach Fuzz was. He was like, oh man, that's O.C. Smith. That's the green one that looks like whoop de whoop I mean, it's like a, not even a dollar record. Like, if it's a dollar, you're paying too much, you know? And it was just like, you know, it was just this kind of thing where, you know, you could just talk about this thing with a cat and, uh, you know, it's like, it sounds like, you know, like Sanskrit to like some people on the outside. But, you know, we're sitting here talking about, oh man, these drums and all oh, that sample and they flip this and that. You know, it was, um, it was just kind of fascinating. It was like, uh, like a collage, you know what I mean? But it's like a sonic one, like an oral collage, you know? And I grew up doing visual art and shit too. When you were starting to acquire the records and you're hearing the music, mm -hmm. you know, what was it that got you to kind of take it to the next place in terms of acquiring the equipment to manipulate those records and kind of create your own thing? Well, I'll say it was two things. One was my cousin, you know, he's real instrumental. And, you know, being that cousin who has the equipment and the records, the older cousin, put me up on things, K Day and all. But him having him going to college, he went to San Diego State. And during that time he got a financial aid check and he bought an S B twelve hundred. So like every weekend he hop in his car, come to my crib, because I was just digging, doing just like what you were saying, buying yeah. records, yeah. listening for little things and whatnot. And he would come through with the S B twelve hundred and we'd be looping up stuff and that shit would got me like, man, I could do that. That type of thing, cause yeah. I'm, you know, I got the ear for that shit. Yeah. And the other shit is everybody who had gear, MPCs, SP 1200s, whoop de whoop, wham wham, with dust on their shit, and just yeah. not making shit that I knew that that gear was capable of making. That's right. Or even using certain records or hearing certain parts in records using that shit. When did you? Uh get your NPC when did you acquire that how long have you had that I think it's been about five years maybe five or six years and over the more. time you've gotten more gear besides the MP yeah I, I actually I started off I had an SP12 and I got from this pawn shop on Fairfax over in Little Ethiopia, Little Ethiopia. yeah I know that yeah, one you're talking about. <laughs> yeah I got the drum it was a you know drum machine drum later all that like the turquoise one kind of with the big drive yeah, yeah 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 but it didn't even have a drive it was just a straight up drum machine and that shit was frustrating because I couldn't sample. Right. What I really wanted to do was sample. I wasn't tripping off just making drum beats and shit. Mm -hmm. So I sold that joint and just started stacking dough, selling incense, going to errands like every day or some shit, yeah. so flipping records in the hood, stacking my dough, man. And finally got me an NPC, 2000 Accelerator. Is that still your, uh, your favorite piece? Like the foundation? I'll say that's my, I know that piece. I and mean, it's fun, but right now I've been using this SP303. That's a like, challenging fun. Right. It's a whole other thing, you know. It's got all these these kind of mysterious options that aren't evident until you start messing with it? Yeah, like on the MPC, it's like whatever you tell it to do, it's going to do. Yeah. With this kind of machine, you, you kind of got to put it in a chokehold and shit. Yeah, yeah. You got to make it. Some it's some work into the shit. It's some actual musicianship that yeah. I kind of like about it, as well as the effects and all that other crazy. Kind of like what that. Uh, kind of like that woman that you meet. That uh, she's got a couple spots, and you got to find them. Pretty much. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and you know you do yeah. what you're doing, and then you hear a certain sound, and you're like, 
oh, is that right? Like, when I do that, is that what happens? Like, okay, there's no manual for it. You yeah. know, you just kind of like. You gotta figure it out. Yeah, I got yeah. my joint. Yeah. I, I hooked it up to the TV. I was just sampling off the TV. Yeah, in the house, just trying to figure it out. Yeah. I ain't know nothing about. I ain't giving away no secrets. I ain't know nothing That's about right. <laughs> nothing. So I was just figuring it out. And I made a few joints. So I like that. I like that. So I wanted to ask you about about the community, like, you know, always uh, moving through and seeing you, you know, we passing through on foot and, uh, you know, there's a certain kind of thing that goes on over there that can kind of, you know, give you a spark, you know, to, to make you do what you do. And yeah. I want to know how much of, of that, you know, goes into what, what you do. A lot of it, you know, just like in my production, a lot of people tell me, they're like, oh, you always got that 808 up in there. And I'm like, who's already knowing when I was in elementary school, to be this big dope dealer dude in the hood named Juice. Juice used to have a Suzuki and he used to roll by the playground knocking EPMD and Zap. Mm -hmm. And that shit would shake the whole playground. Like the whole playground would just stop. People would be just like, like growing off that shit. So that shit still affected me from then to now. That's a part of my sound, but yeah, just the energy of what goes on, the records, a lot of the records that I hear people use. I hear it played around in people's cars, passing by, mm -hmm. that type of thing. But you know, and the different people, you know. Right. We're actually, like you say, on foot in that hood, you might run into a player right. who was in that Tapscott book or something. You know what I'm saying? For real. Might run right. into a cat on the bus who was in the Pan African People's Orchestra or something. It's that kind of thing. Yeah, man. So. Yeah. So what's the illest beat you didn't find in the hood, like? Some community shit. It would be uh, something I got from Kamal back when he uh, he wasn't even working with the shop anymore. He would just kind of set up randomly on the weekends, like just pull up with crates and have them in the back of his whip, or like set up on a table out in front of the world stage. And he had two Leroy Jones pieces, Amiri Baraka, and he had one of them on Shahad with the orange label, and uh, the other one was on Motown's uh, offshoot Black Forum. It's Nation Time. Oh my goodness, and it, you know, gatefold cover, you know, it looked like a Dr. York book, like, it, yeah. you know, like, Ethiopian, you know, like, Egyptian, and it was just, like, really powerful, uplifting sound, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, you feel it when you hear it, you know? Uh, there was a song on there called uh, S.O.S., you know, calling all black people, S.O.S., black people, come in wherever you are, S.O.S., you know, like, it was just real heavy, and Kamal was, like, in the position where he wasn't trying to hoard too much wax anymore, but he appreciated the music. He was like, I'll flip it to you, but just make me a tape. You know, and it was kind of before the CD era, so it was really about the tape, you know what I'm saying? And, um... Who I thought said? Say it again. I'll flip it for you. All right. Say which one? Flipping the record onto a tape. Oh, okay. It was, uh... Yeah, he was like, you know, I'll, I'll flip the records to you. You know, it's nothing to me, but, uh... I just want you to make me a tape of it, you know, because it's still, you know, it's, it's important, you know, it's something that's, that's really heavy. And, um, you know, it was as easy as that, making a tape for him. It was before the CD era, you know, and it was the kind of thing everybody had a tape deck, you know. And, um, you know, I still have those records right now, of course. And, um, you know, I mess with them. I've, I've touched them in various ways and, you know, done, uh, done some beats with them and, you know, put them on some tapes and stuff, you know. Because sometimes, you know, the words get people's attention, you know, make them pay attention to the sounds that are about to come next. Where the music is now, Gene, it's, uh, it's become something that is used to sell a lot of stuff. And so a lot of the artists aren't really getting their art on. And I want to know what you think about the possibility of maintaining, you know, artistic freedom and integrity but still making it something that people are going to want to hear. Because good music is good music. You know, it's something like people don't really know what they don't know until they hear it. That's true. But the whole thing is you got to give them the option to at least hear it. You know what I'm saying? A lot of these people, like in the community, they, they bug off like the venues that, you know, the soul children throw, y'all cats throw down there. Like, a particular joint to me, like, that SpaceX Eve joint, that joint was like four years old, and then y'all brought it to the community, and now it's just like a classic on some shit. Like, yeah. People are just getting open to them tunes and certain things. So it's like the music is still timeless. It's just a matter of breaking it to the correct people. Yeah, 
regardless of what it is or whatever. Cause I've seen people on, like I said, in Merck Park dancing in the bugs in the attic, and they from Europe. Exactly right. Not even knowing not it, not knowing, being even Not knowing what none of that is. Not knowing, you know, not really knowing. Even in over there, not knowing Fela Kuti. But then when you play that joint and it just hit them, and then, you know, other DJs around the town, they start playing it and hooking up comps and pushing that music somewhere, you know, can I say, um, presenting that music in another form, it's, it's still new to them. Like I say, they don't know it. They don't know it, man. It's new to them. And it, it kind of feels like a, a bit of a responsibility, but in a good way. You know, it's yeah. kind of like, you know, it's like when you put your records together when you're going to go play out. You know, you want to bring some things like, you know, bring up some stuff that, that they're going to like, but they don't have to know what it is. But you just know that it's going to be familiar to them, you know? Yeah, that's, and, um, yeah, that's kind of what I feel good about. I feel, like, confident and good about DJing in the community because I'm playing for people who don't know, but they really feel. They feel. They know all of this shit. They know the feeling of it. They just don't know the song or... And not hip to the latest, the latest 12 inch or the latest EP or the latest producer or whatnot, but when they hear it, they have gone off that shit. It's like a spiritual trance up in there, man. I've seen it before. It's, it's true, man. It's something, too, about the community. You know, there's a big, uh, a lot of emphasis put on the sounds in your whip, you know, like how you, you know, how you hit corners, you know what I'm saying? And, you know, yeah, I've been so. many a bus stop and if you, you know, pull up next to me, just subbing, like just clowning, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, like, there's this Kill. kind of, this nod and acknowledgement that you give, you know, and they're, you know, they know that you know, you know what I'm saying, and you sure. know that they know that they, you know what I mean. Yeah. It's, a, it's a trip. It's like they could be hooded out, you know what I mean. They could be, you know, just yeah, you know don't what even, I mean. You know, even tripping. Like y'all, y'all saying that one beat. Like whenever I'm at a bus stop, to my roll up, and they knocking that, you know, it's that Snoop Dogg candy beat. Yeah. <laughs> on the, I don't care. If it's on the motorcycle. It's in the bus that is whip. Yeah. I don't give a shit. Yeah. Shit is like shaking everything around. Me. And everybody got this doo-doo face. Yeah, yeah man. That shit. What? One of those for me is uh, uh, Pac, So Many Tears. Oh, man. Uh, Shock G, Flip, Stevie Wonder's That Girl. He destroyed that shit. Hey. I mean, it's like, and you know, I mean, so many, you know, I was in Oakland one time. Yeah. You know what I mean? And the motherfucker just, and I was like, wow. Like, it's just, you know, it's just this thing. You know, you just hear it, the harmonicas and shit. And, you know, it's just a... Uh, I don't know, it's just this communication, you know, it is It is like, you know, the communication through the beats, for sure, you know yeah. what I mean, you can see where a cat is at, you know, um, you know, I know uh, some people that live a way different life, you know, a way more hectic life, you know, but they always got love for me in the hood, you know what I mean, for like sure. homies that are, you know, doing a lot of crazy shit will pull up on me and be like, man, what you doing walking around over here, nigga, it's crazy, you know what I'm saying, let me scoop you up, where you going, you know, I'm like, I'm cool, <laughs> I got you, let's go. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And they, you know. Same, you know, you yeah, know. man. Same story. <laughs> exactly. Man. Exactly what you just said. And it's cool. It's a trip. It, it shows you that, you know, people really know and they recognize what's up. You know, they. That's funny, they, right? They get something out of it, you know. I got one for you today. Before I came here, I like, like stopped at the tree spot and shit. And it was hot. You know, it's sheriffs all around and shit. So I'm like bailing on me like a spot is hot, whoop de whoop. So I'm bailing from the spot. I go around the corner. This dude comes around the corner and get me like, hey, homie. Can't have you going out with no trees, homie. You got them beats and all that shit, homie. Whoop, whoop. Right. So, dude, like, gave me, you know, took care of me just on the strength that I got some dope beats. Yeah. He telling every, everybody else to keep pushing, like, they don't deserve it. Oh, that's right. He's like, <laughs> like keep moving. Oh, like, keep that dude. He likes, and, you know. I gave him an old beat CD. Yeah. It's just cool cats. This is the vibe of the community. They support their artists, they know about you. That's you true. That's that side that never gets any light, you know? Yeah. That's the side that they uh, they blow the candle out on, you know what I mean? True. They want to put the other stuff on blast, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. The homie out there in his homie's t-shirt, you know, <laughs> talking about something foolish, you know? Yeah. Instead of like, you know, like some real heavy stuff, man, you know, like, you can play something real soulful or something and, you know. Dweller. Like, you know what I'm saying? Well in the hood. Man. You should see that. Man. And it's like, it's like you said, it's new to them. Yeah. Space act. You know what I mean? It's space music to them. They're like, wow, this is. Yeah. But it's you know, it's right in something too, man. It's it's a, you know, everybody's got a drum machine, right? You yeah, know what I'm saying? Everybody life. got a drum yeah, machine. Hard beat so alive. Without that, you know, nothing's popping. So you know, some frequencies are not for everybody, you know. True. But when you find your frequency, you know, it's like you know, find a famous spot to kick or something. Yeah. You can't stop going there. 
that was nice. Suckers out here be talking about actors are dead. Can you say some shit dead at least? Yeah. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think that's 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 foolish. That's like, you know, there's just there's so much there that's that's never gonna make it to digital. It's um there's so much there that's never gonna make it to digital that it's just beneath the radar, you know what I'm saying? It's um they're like, you know, finding old scrolls and whatnot, you know, yeah. old teachings and things, you know what I mean? That kind of stuff starts society, just starts movements, you know? Yeah. I mean think about like I don't even know, X Clan or Native Tongues or something. You know, cats started like, you know, getting off port, you know, and trying to figure out who Garvey was and what was it like Star Line and you know what I'm saying? It gave them something that they didn't have before, you know, coming out of like that era like the eighties or whatever. It's like every era that you have an advancement in the community, then they come up with some kind of poison to destroy that advancement. You know, whether it's the Coke rock, you know, or the strap, you know what I'm saying, or the ache, the heroin, you know what I'm saying, or the water. <laughs> Um, no, not the drinking water, exactly. Um, the banging, it's just like, but then they'll say that these records are dead, but then they'll come and take them all, and they'll put them someplace that it makes it out of reach for you to get to. And they want to sell it back to you for, you know, more than it should be sold for. Yeah. And they don't even really understand why that particular piece is sought after or heavy, you know? Maybe somebody told them about it or it was in a book or something, but they don't really understand like what's on it, you know, what difference it makes. Uh, what about me, Stan? Oh, you yeah. Be I, doing fine. Okay, I just I was throwing off kind of yeah. spacing out talking. Well, that's all good. Come you know, with the mic real quick. But yeah, it'll 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 never stop, man. It'll never stop, you know. I mean, they're still, you know, tinkering around in, in My the tombs of pharaohs in Egypt, you know, looking for other treasures, you know what I'm saying? Other things that they could use to motivate them to continue to try to control, you know? Yeah. And, uh, you know, they'll tell you there's nothing there, but there's always something there, you know? That's um, probably not. Uh, it's an old record guy. Like, oh, there's no more. Nobody's using records. People sell them, they throw them on the curb. You know, you're walking around the hood, you see crates of records on the curb, you know, and you know, it's just like they they devalue it, you know, they take the value off of it in a certain part of the world, certain community, but then the value multiplies in other parts, you know. It's kind of interesting, you know. Um, but I think uh, you know, it, it, it's not going any place, you know. It just gets a little more difficult to find, but that only makes it better for those that are passionate, you know? Because if you seek it out, you'll find it, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, so I'm out with it now. I'm out with it. I look for stuff that people use, but mm -hmm. I'm also trying to create my own breaks that somebody else can go look for. Exactly. Pay $20 for, I'll pay 50 cents for, 35 cents. That's right. Whatever for, that's really my thing now. That's true, it's like, um, at this point, anything can become something. You know, something that's in your face every day. And um, there's not much monetary value on it. You know, nobody's ever used it before. You know, that can become, you know, a way that you can communicate and share something with somebody. Yeah. Teach them something about something that was right under their nose, you know? Yeah, that's one thing about secondhand sewer shops. I've always, I mean, it was kind of easy to me, can I say? Yeah. It was like I always find just something on the record. Cause it's, on everything, man. It's just like, I don't know, man. I mean, maybe maybe there's stuff that you can't play out per se. Oh yeah, you can't. Like I can't run this joint. You oh, know what I'm saying? Yeah, like the girls are gonna, you know, look at me stuck. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but drink some. you know, but you can take that thing and make it into something. Exactly. You know, I remember um, an interview with Dilla where he was discussing donuts, and he said his motivation for doing that kind of chopping was there were MCs that would want to fuck with certain songs, but they weren't the kind of songs that you could really fuck with or bust over. And he was like, I want to turn these things that are just around us all the time. I want to find these little sweet spots in these particular songs. Like, I need to do this shit, you know, like it's everyday shit. And it was just like, that's, that was the whole motivation for that. I mean, and most of those beats are just reworks of an individual song. It's not even like he was piling other songs and laying them over each other. He would just disassemble the song and like, you know. I mean, it was a, but I mean, that, that, that was a deal. It was just like, you know. It's like, it's always viable, you know? It's just like, let me just put this in a way that these people are gonna get, you know what I'm saying? And uh, I wanna ask you about your first Poobah release and how
how things have grown out of that, from that. Uh, first release was a day and night EP with me and uh, my man Black Monk. Wow, that release was 300 records. Say it again. It no, I'm sorry. The fir first release. Do it again now. First the first release. Re right there. <laughs> sorry, sorry. That's me. Um, <laughs> my bad. Okay. <laughs> uh, first release was the Day and Night EP on Kuba Records. It was uh, 300 copies. One man, Black Monk. One man, Ron put up the loo and on the record. And she flew out of here. Not like 300. It's like. Doing Curtis Jackson numbers. And it was like, it was good for what? Yeah, it is. You know, it was a good opening for what we do now. And that shit is still floating around. They like did a repress with Japan on it. Yeah. And I was tripping. Like, Y'all still like that old stuff? Good response, right? Yeah, the response is still good. And with the success of that record, we've been able to release other cats. It's kind of inspired us motivate us to put out you know, your release and release from other members of this community that we have at Nambo. Mm. And then you put out Oh, fun. Yeah. Day and night, and it was uh, Overcast 78 EP. Yeah. That was like my, so I want to step it up and shit, but it wasn't like so far. It was just a, a step. Mm -hmm. Take a bunch of steps, so I just stepped it up. That was one of my favorites. And then from there I did, uh, what did I do? Did I beat some one? It was the first 10 inch. That was like the first one out of all these 10 that we got coming up. Which four are already out, you know what I'm saying? And it's just all these releases, they all kind of coincide in terms of just the hip hop stuff and the beat stuff. That stuff is like, it gets everybody ready in season for whatever the next release is gonna be. You know what I'm right. saying? Like each thing helps to make the path for the next thing easier to travel, right? Exactly. You know, it gains, you know, gains, gains fans and, and a following. Um, it enabled me to have an opportunity to uh, to release a seven inch. Yeah. You know, and um, it's, it's all out. <laughs> it's, uh, it's all out. It's nice. Okay. It's interesting that um, the things that we create, you know, have like a life outside of ourselves and they kind of go on and become a part of the lives of other people. You know what I mean? It's the kind of stuff like, you know, I play your joints when I play out. You know what I'm saying? Like, I've been out and heard my joint played out. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Or, you know, maybe someone has sent me an email saying something about it, you know, or I've read a review about it someplace, you know. Even if the review wasn't favorable, you know, it's interesting that it was something that made them think or say or do something. Exactly. You know what I mean? It was like it wasn't um, ignored. It wasn't forgotten. You know what I'm saying? And it just, it um, it was like all leading up to this kind of thing, you know? Like the records lead you to making the records and then they become the records that people go after and those will inspire them to do the things that they need to do, you know? Hey, what did you put on your 45? Oh, um... There's a, uh, it's uh, the the 45 that plays at 33, <laughs> you know, three short beats on a side. Seven inch. Um, I got into this, I don't know, just this thing. I guess it's from listening to so many beat tapes. You know, it's about like, just getting right to it. You know what I mean? And then just, to the point. just get to it. You know what I mean? Like sometimes there's there's just such a build up and such an introduction that it loses you because it doesn't get you. Or when the payoff comes, sometimes. Mm -hmm. You feel like, oh man, you know, you know what I mean. But if it just gets right there, it's, you know, and then it changes before you can even get onto that, and then it comes. You know what I'm saying? It's just something that it's it's kind of fascinating, like the like the DJ sort of thing, like when you're playing and you kind of manipulate the stuff as it's happening. You know, like you're looking at the people, looking at what you're doing, and it makes you do something different. You know, based yeah. on that. You know what I mean? And yeah. you know, with the music, you know, kind of like the same thing. But I just became fascinated with the shorter things. Like it's just it's almost like more. It's like, man, you know, if all these things are really short, we can have more stuff to share, you know? But it also becomes an exercise for the things that need to be longer. Sometimes you need to say more. Yeah. You know what I mean? But it's like, it's, it's, a, it's a process, it's steps, you know? It's like um, cooking before you eat. <laughs> you gotta prepare it before you eat.
How does the yeah, growing up in the your neighborhood, yeah, how is it sort of um, affected the way you hear music and the way you create? You know, versus if you were from the valley originally or from, you know, or from the bay. Mm -hmm. Where if you're from the same neighborhood, I'm from the yeah. same neighborhood he's from. That's right. So what has the yeah, neighborhoods to, you know, sort of you know, done to ch you know, change the way you hear music? I think it's uh, it's shown me that there's a lot of magic in the the simple things that are around us every day. Like, you know, going to the liquor store to get, like, some candy or whatever. And they're playing, you know, like, heavy music in the liquor store, you know, and it's, like, it's grimy, you know? Like, you're stepping over people to get in there, you know what I'm saying? And, like, it's, you know, like, the Federation is, you know, riding through, blurping people, like, it's crazy, you know? And, and like, in the middle of that, you'll hear, like, you know, Stephanie Mills or something. Like, something that's every day, but it, like, it, it becomes this this other kind of thing, like it's, um, you know, like it kind of embodies a, a time, you know what I'm saying? And it's something that like, you know, everything I guess is a, a product of the environment that created it. And so it's like you can't get away from where you've come from and it influences what you do. And it also shows you that there's a lot more in what people call the hood, right, in the community than what they think is there. You know, because I'm up in there listening to like all kinds of other things as well that you would imagine, you know, are not in the hood. You know, it's just like there's a lot of diversity and a lot of education and a lot of uh, inspiration, you know. And, um, you know, I wouldn't have wanted to do it any, any other way for sure not, you know. Um, yeah. yeah. It's pretty much exactly what he just said. It's, like he said, when I was elementary school, the biggest thing to me is when new cats to pass by, they have K Day or just something just knocking and shaking the playground. And that, um, you said going to the liquor store or getting in your auntie's cutlass, <laughs> yeah. and she's knocking champagne, Evelyn Champagne King, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Knocking Alexander O'Neill. No, <laughs> Waking up in my, in my mom's house, you know, going to the bathroom as a kid, need a baker's knocking. Like them kind of things that kind of grew on me and stuck on me, and I don't think I'll be where I am for all that. In terms of appreciating this music and having the knowledge of it, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. There was a time when it had gotten to the place, like, you know, when, when there was a lot of dope in there or whatever, and people were making money, you know? Yeah. So cats were like really doing it, you know, like rolling through with like, you know, just the trunks shaking, you know what I mean? The license plate. Outlines. You know? But they would be banging like, like, BDP, like I can remember fools, you know, from West I can't name. Was it, was it <laughs> Ron, Ronnie Hudson, West Coast pop? Line. Yeah, like I mean, you know, it's like wow, it was a, uh, it wasn't like there wasn't a a music that a gangster played per se. Like, oh, this is yeah. my soundtrack. Like, I'm gonna thug it up. Yeah. Like, you know, it was like they thugged it up to whatever was out. It was just if it was the yeah. knock, that's that's what got the rotation. You know what I mean? And like, exactly. it was just you know, it was crazy. You know, I mean. I've seen fools hitting switches to print. You know what I mean? Coming down like, you know, like sideways off like, if I was your girlfriend. Like, stupidity, you know what I mean? Like, but you would think this cat wouldn't be doing that. You know what I'm saying? Because, you know, he's the homie that, you know, he does other kinds of stuff. You know what I'm saying? Like, but it just, like, it just showed you that it's, you know, it's just, you got to be what you are, man. You know, you got to do it how you do it. Like, don't worry about what people think about it, you know? Because there'll be that, that time where maybe somebody heard something about you. And so your name appears on the fly. So they're gonna come see you do your thizzle. And they get there and maybe you're afraid to do your thing, so you're gonna do this other thing. Yeah. You wanna make sure that you always represent all the time. So. Be as savage as you can be, so that they'll be able to say, yeah. man, that fool is crazy, regardless. Yeah. Like, they might not even be fucking with you like that, but they'll be able to say, like, he kept it authentic all the time. Yeah, he was always him. He was always him, you know? Yeah. I mean, like, again, you know, like. Not a buster or anything. Yeah, like, you know, like in, we used to do something in the Merck Park, Juju, you know, and it like grew into like a real crazy thing where, you know, there'd be like, you know, gangsters in there and whatnot, and they'd be in the back like tripping. They'd be like, man, Cuz is weird, but he's dope as fuck. 
You know what I mean? That's like the greatest That's the compliment. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, man, like, dude is like, you know what I mean? Like, I saw him outside on the Deuce Deuce, and like, you know, he's in here now, like, and I mean, he's, you know, it's just this whole, they have a respect for you. You know, when I go through that hood now, it's like, you know, I mean, you know, they I give me the, like the presidential, man, you know, for real. Like, dudes are like, you know, like, saluting and like, it's a trip, man, just off of, you know, sharing beats, you know what I'm saying? It's like, you? And you gotta, you know, so it just it reinforces it, you know? So again, even if, you know, you find yourself someplace where people aren't as, as receptive to it, you know, you can't ever let it stop. DJ Shaker. This is Ross G. And we're at Poo Bob. We're chilling at Poo Bob's. Thank you. Where the weed at?